Chapter 5, Part 3, we're going to find out about enzymes, and this is something that we're going to deal with in the lab this week as well. One way to think of enzymes is tools. When you're dealing with a lot of energy in our bodies, then it stands to reason that we need some tools to help us get the energy to the right place, perhaps to extract the energy, and so that we can be efficient about how we use it. It's fine to say, well, we need to produce a large amount of energy, but if it all comes into one place, what are we going to do with it there? We need the energy to be distributed, and we need it to be made available in the places where we actually need it. Now, the many chemical reactions that go on in your body are collectively known as metabolism. And metabolism is something that runs very efficiently only because we have a no, large number of proteins called enzymes to help along with it. In fact, some of these reactions in your body may not run at all unless enzymes are present. So enzymes are the tools that help us run our body efficiently and allow us to control the chemistry in our body to begin with. If you want a reaction to take place, in some cases, an enzyme needs to be there. So the enzyme may act as an on and off switch. If you want something to happen, turn it on, produce the enzyme. If you don't want something to happen, turn it off, don't produce the enzyme. And our body can do these kind of things. We have these kind of switches. I think it's probably clear to all of you that if you are going to sit in a lecture, you need a different set of metabolic reactions and a different amount of energy than if you're going to go and race around the track outside. So clearly our body needs to be capable of producing more and doing more, but it doesn't have to do that all the time. You would be losing a huge amount of energy if right now sitting in your chair you were going to expend the same amount of energy used for racing around the track outside. So you don't want that. Your body needs to be able to adjust, and enzymes help with this. Enzymes are a key tool in helping us deal with something called activation energy. As I said, not every reaction that's possible in your body needs to happen all the time. Some types of reactions only need to happen occasionally or perhaps in a pinch when you really need a boost. But how do we know this? Well, our body does certain things. There are ways by which our body recognizes when it needs to produce more. And enzymes help with this process. The energy of activation is something to get us going. Perhaps analogous to having your car start with the use of a battery. Clearly, when you get into your car and you put your key in the lock, you have an expectation that that car is going to start. And the only way you're going to start it is with that little energy boost that comes from your battery. And so you can deliver the energy of activation to start your car by using that battery. And that's a good thing, because you don't want your car started and running all the time. You have to have a way to shut it down and you want to be able to start it back up. And so the energy barrier that is created by having to shut that car off is what allows us to save gasoline. Gasoline then doesn't break down all the time. We can keep it in the tank and we will only use it when we need it. Our body is very similar to this. This energy of activation prevents us from using all this energy up when we don't really need it, which gives us control. Gives us control over how much energy we expend at any given moment. Now here's an example for how energy of activation may work in your body. On the left of each of these, you can see that there is the energy level the energy level in red. And here you have a set of reactants, and these reactants can produce products like this. 
Now, when you look carefully at this, this is actually sucrose. And down here, this is glucose. And this is fructose. And so this is showing you the process by which a sugar molecule can be broken down in the body. Well, we don't always need sugar to be broken down. We only need to do it some of the time. And so there is a barrier here, and this barrier means that in order to separate these two molecules, what we need to do is put in a certain amount of energy to jump over that energy barrier. Now, an enzyme is able to help us lower this energy of activation. And so on the right, what you can see is that with the enzyme present, it's going to be a lot easier to overcome this much smaller <coughs> energy barrier. So if you look at this side, you can have this happen spontaneously, but not very often. With the enzyme present, you can have it happen a lot more frequently. And so the reaction can proceed with greater efficiency when the enzyme is present and when you take the enzyme away the reaction will slow down to a sort of a minimum now if you suddenly need a lot of energy that's what happens your body is going to make that enzyme available and it's going to lower the energy of activation and the sugar is going to be broken down and it'll feed into cellular respiration and give you more energy what it means is that each one of us could now decide to jump up and run a race to the best of our abilities and that energy would become available very quickly whereas while you're sitting there this energy of activation is high it's in place and therefore you're not using up all that energy but you could immediately kickstart it if that's what you wanted now enzymes are pretty cool and like I said before they are tools they are very selective in what they do and they operate like a lock and a key. In order for this enzyme to do something, it needs to have a proper key. And this kind of relationship, just like with the lock and key, is called induced fit. Each enzyme, it turns out, functions only with one specific molecular reaction. And that's a good thing, because that way, one kind of enzyme isn't going to get into the way of another kind of enzyme. It also makes sense intuitively. If you have a lock and it's your car, well then my key shouldn't fit in that lock. So intuitively it makes sense to have the one lock and the one key. And so of course what this means is a specific enzyme needs to be present for a specific chemical reaction to occur in a cell and when that enzyme is not there, no other enzyme is going to replace its function. When you look at an enzyme reaction, you're going to need an enzyme, that would be the lock, and the substrate, that would be the key. So the substrate and the enzyme, they are going to work together to achieve whatever, whatever it is that needs to be done. Now you'll find that in order to recognize which is an enzyme and which is a substrate, sometimes it's just easy to look for the ending, ASE. And so in this case, dehydrogenase is an enzyme that pulls hydrogens off of something. Often they tell you what they do. Enzymes can also be used multiple times. Just like you have a wrench that you can use for a specific size bolt, you can use that same wrench multiple times. It's not like you have to throw it away every time you, you use it. So they are catalysts. And it turns out when you look at our body's chemistry, catalysts are a very efficient way to conduct a lot of the body's business. Because that way, we have a lot of parts available that we don't need to reproduce all the time. So here is how an enzyme's activity may work. The first part is, this enzyme here is called sucrase. The ASC ending tells you it's an enzyme. The SUCR tells you that it's going to 
break down sucrose. Sucrose versus sucrase. One is the sugar, the other one is the enzyme. And when you look at the enzyme, you can see clearly it has the active side. That's like the keyhole. So the active side of the enzyme is like the keyhole of the lock. There's your substrate. This is sucrose. And what we're trying to do in this particular reaction is very straightforward. What we're trying to do is break this bond. That's the goal. This is what the enzyme called sucrase does. Sucrase breaks down the sucrose. And so here you have the both of them together. There is your key. There is your lock. And the two are plugged in. Now you can do something with that. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use a hydrolysis reaction. You can see this here. There's water. And we add water to break the bond, and therefore that is hydrolysis. And the sucrose is converted to the products. If you notice here, there is the bond, and now it's not there anymore. As soon as you break that bond, this is no longer sucrose. If it's no longer sucrose, then they don't fit anymore and the enzyme will kick them out. So at the end, you have glucose and fructose, and that enzyme is empty again, and it can start over. And you'll find this with any kind of enzyme reaction. The enzyme works, the enzyme does, it, does its job, and when it's done, it can start over. It turns out that enzymes are influenced by the environment. And it sometimes is uh, an issue with enzyme function when the environment isn't quite right. And there are, there are a variety of things that happen. As we'll see in the lab this week, temperature could be an issue because when you have a three-dimensional structure, let's think of a, a protein structure, and it may have certain kinds of features, so there's maybe your protein. And now what happens is you heat that up. Well, heating it up <clears throat> may force this part of the protein out. Just because it's getting hot, this is no longer stable, and it changes its three-dimensional shape. It changes its three-dimensional shape, and as a consequence, it's no longer useful. Sometimes this is irreversible. Salt. If you stick a salt molecule somewhere in parts of an enzyme like this, then that could be a problem. So if you, if you squeeze some salt in here and it makes this opening change shape, or perhaps if you change the pH, all of those things can completely debilitate an enzyme. Now, when that kind of thing happens, the enzyme becomes useless. The enzyme becomes useless and when it becomes useless, it's going to slow down your metabolism. And that sometimes happens when you add chemicals to your body that your body doesn't really like. It impacts the enzymes, and that's why you feel crummy. Enzymes also require helper molecules. Some of these are inorganic. We call those cofactors. And these may be metal ions. It could be small molecules of various types. Or we call them coenzymes organic helper molecules. So just sometimes like your key for your lock needs to be greased a little bit. This is what the grease is for the enzyme reaction. There are also ways by which you can slow down enzymes and this is one of the things that's very useful in fighting infections. If you identify the enzyme and you want to stop its activity you can use what's called an inhibitor. And the enzyme inhibitor ends up plugging up the active site. Rather than using the substrate, you use something different and you plug it up. And here's how this works. You can see that there is a substrate, and this substrate in this greenish color is the normal one. That is what you like to have. Perhaps it's a sugar that you break apart. Perhaps it's another kind of reaction. But now what we do in order to stop this 
we are introducing an inhibitor. And the inhibitor looks similar, and the enzyme will accept it as if it were the substrate, but it's not the substrate, and it binds permanently. The enzyme cannot break it down, therefore it never releases it. Now, if you treat somebody with antibiotics, some antibiotics have this effect on bacterial enzymes. Not on your own enzymes, but only on bacterial enzymes. And so this would prevent the bacteria from making more bacteria, for example. There are also inhibitors that can change the shape of the enzyme because they can bind to the back side of the enzyme, for example. So here is one case where the active site normally has this shape, and if you look at the area here, you can see how large it is. But here, with the inhibitor moving into the back side of the enzyme, that changes the active site ever so slightly, and so now this area is much smaller, and it can no longer fit the substrate. So there are various ways by which to fiddle around with enzyme activity, and of course, we are learning about how this can be used to our advantage when it comes to bacteria, or perhaps sometimes when our metabolism is hyperactive and we are trying to slow it down. When there are issues with your body's function, maybe it's genetic, maybe something else, and it produces too much of something, well then sometimes all you need to do is provide something that inhibits an enzyme and you get the problem solved. And that's the end of part three.